This is a conference of experts, and one important stream of this conference, Practice, Connect, Celebrate, is an opportunity to share more ideas about supporting each other's progress and work. Some challenges are managing isolation, difference, and differences of approach, maintaining our energy and optimism, our self-care, and sustaining our energy. To speak with experience about all three words, practice, connect, and celebrate, our presenter is Bob Brown. Bob is well known for leading the Australian Greens to a historic result with more than 1.6 million Australians voting for the Greens in 2010. He was elected to the Australian Senate for Tasmania in 1996 and was an outspoken voice in opposition to the Conservative government and in support of environmental and human rights issues, as well as international issues. He was re-elected to the Senate in 2001 and 2007. Please welcome Bob Brown. Thanks, everybody. And it's a great privilege to be on this stage with these wonderful presenters. Well, I've never been happier in my life. Uh, I've just ticked over 70, and I said I'd retired from the Senate, but actually I've just transferred. I'm uh, doing what I like doing all the time, and uh, I have a very great uh, treasure trove travelling with me today, which uh, is, the, is a reason for my happiness, and I'll come back to that in a bit, but that's uh, my partner, Paul Thomas. Uh, fresh from going around the lambs this morning on the farm in Tasmania. Um, uh, it's Paul's the reason why I got through 16 years in the Senate and then uh, I'm living uh, an extraordinarily happy and productive uh, career here through into uh, aged care somewhere down the line. And um, I'd love to be part of helping transform that area and the very good people who work in it. Uh, for a better society into the future. I came out, uh, well, I, was, I had double trouble. I was gay and I was a greenie. I came out as being gay first. And um, that was 1976. But of course, by then I was in my uh, thir early 30s and a lot more had happened. I knew I was gay from my preteen years and struggled with that a great deal and repressed it to the point of having an almost fatal illness, a fulminant colitis, with everybody saying, what's wrong? You must be anxious about something and uh, not being able to say what it was. Because you know, the world has transformed in the time uh, I've been thinking about it wonderfully. Uh, this conference could not have taken place then and had anybody dared hold a conference like this, the police would have arrived and closed it down on the basis of obscenity, if nothing else. Uh, and one of the great things for me has been seeing this and be living part of this transformation. Back then, of course, they had recently abolished the death penalty, uh, but they still had a 20-year jail term for uh, males who engaged in sexual activity. And I write about in my book, Optimism, the young guy in Launceston in 1958 who had the police arrive at his door and opened it up and they said, do you live here? And he said, yes. And I said, who else lives here? And he pointed to his 21-year-old partner and they just walked around the house and saw that there was one bed. And those two guys were taken straight to the lockup. They had no legal representation uh, and they were jailed for three years. Uh, destruction of all they uh, lived with and for so recently in Australian history. It's not too difficult to relate with the horror show for people elsewhere on the, on the planet, not least in Africa, or, for example, the young guys who were hung earlier this year in Iran simply because they loved each other. And what is very, very important is that while transforming our own society, 
we uh, be part of transforming the way the world malfunctions, the human world malfunctions, uh, as it moves towards an acceptability which is based on the fact of a universal realisation and back up by law that on this planet it's one person, one value, one vote, one planet. We're all in it together and we're all totally and thoroughly equal. And so um, in 19, uh, well in the 1960s I went off to the psychiatrist as uh, some of you may have heard before, I got testosterone and injections, it took all the money I had, I couldn't go home on school weekends. But the, the impulsion was to change to being heterosexual and the problem with the injections of, of uh, testosterone was it didn't even put hair on my chest, didn't change a thing at all. <laughs> Went off and had some shock therapy then uh, and every time there was a picture of a male put up on the screen I uh, got an electric shock and every time a picture of a female was put up got a glass of water. But the problem was I liked women anyway. Uh, it didn't change the sexuality. Uh, and let me say here and now that people who persist in purveying to LGBTI citizens, A, that they ought to reform who they are, and B, that there is some means of doing that, that ought to be a criminal offence, if anything's going to be a criminal offence in our day and age. Anyway, in the midst of all this, I was 18 or 19, I was walking up City Road in Sydney. Uh, I was at Sydney University studying medicine and said to myself, if I ever get out of this, I'm going to do something for other people who are in the same situation. And the best thing I could have done about that, well, I sat uh, in at the point where the museum is here now, because I came as a resident at the Canberra Community Hospital, sat out on the end of the point there and, and thought about swimming. I knew I couldn't get across the lake, I could get halfway. So if I went halfway, I couldn't get back. And I sat there for a long, long time thinking about that, but I had loving family, thank God. And uh, I took a remarkable breakout decision the next day and went and bought a ticket to London. And that got me away into a society where I wasn't worried about people around me. And I went to, of all things, another psychologist. I went to a number of them. But the last fellow, and he's a very good looking young man on the South Bank in London, <laughs> sat back in his chair, listened to my story, saw the alarm on my face about my homosexuality and said to me, hey Bob, you're gay. Why don't you live and enjoy it? Why don't you be who you are? Now, I was astonished by being told this by somebody. Uh, it took a long while to recover from what he had to say. And I don't know where he is now, but I'd love to find him and give him a hell of a big hug because it was pure common sense. Be who you are. Not what the law says. Uh, not what uh, somebody in the pulpit tells you has to be right, or even friends making jokes at the expense of some uh, minority feature in the way we are human beings. Well, it took a long while nevertheless. In the 19, by 1976, I'd gone to Tasmania. I was go went there to look for the Tasmanian tiger, which is extinct. It was shot out by government fiat, the only animal on the planet that by dint of law has been uh, shot to extinction. There's a lot going to extinction now. We're at 500 times the rate of extinction in the natural world due to our human herd of 7.3 billion people marauding this planet at the moment. And I'll come back to that in a little bit. But I also wanted to look at Lake Pedder, one of the most gently beautiful places on Earth. And I saw there were people on black and white television saying uh, this place is about to be destroyed for a a tittle of, uh, of electricity and I ran into those people uh, and then the nascent Greens party which remarkably had policies back then of respecting indigenous culture and valuing 
Indigenous rights, of uh, espousing equality of the sexes and women's rights. It wasn't explicit about gay rights because uh, they weren't discussed in any forum, any political forum that I'm aware about, but it was implicit and I knew that if tested, that would be added to the list. And so I'd fallen in with a political line of thought which was about every individual is equal, which uh, made me feel that I was at home. So in 1976, well, I'd been down the Franklin River with a bearded forester who couldn't find anybody else silly enough to do it. And he met me one day on the steps of the library and said, Bob, will you come and raft? I've heard you're a bit of an adventurer. Will you come and raft down the river with me? And uh, I said, oh, yeah, I'll do that, Paul, if you'll go walking with me uh, and a couple of companions into the mountains of the wild southwest of Tasmania. So we did that. But as the day approached, I, I knew that in sitting by campfires uh, night after night with a single other person, you get to talk about the most uh, deep and intimate things. And I didn't want to get halfway down the river and find myself with somebody who... Um, couldn't tolerate the news. So I went and said to Paul one day, I drew a big breath and said, Paul, I'm a homosexual. And he looked at me and said, well, Bob, I'm a trout fisherman. <laughs> and I can tell a good looking trout from a poor quality one I can tell a good-looking bloke from somebody else, but whatever, doesn't matter to me. I'm glad you told me. And so off we went down the river. Uh, there were a few jokes along the way, uh, but uh, when I came back, uh, and the Frank, I was by now a confirmed greenie. I was for looking after uh, such places as this fabulous river, which was about to be wrecked from end to end the less output of electricity than you can get from a big solar-based power station these days, with its sea eagles floating in the ravines, waterfalls, great side canyons, 4,000-year-old hewn pine trees. If you get the opportunity, um, it costs a bit of money if you're going to do it commercially, but I recommend Paul and I went down there five or six years ago and we came out of this experience. It's 10 days, totally wild country, uh, take a rafting trip on the Franklin. It's now been classified as one of the great whitewater rafting experiences on the planet and as part of Tasmania's economic growth and job growth in uh, 2015. The saving of that river is, I guess, another story. But Paul, after I got back, I knew I was, by then, what an impost it was to be gay in those days and uh, encouraged me uh, to be public about it, and that I was later in the year. I went on an ABC program. Boy, when I look at that film now, can I see somebody who's terrified? <laughs> As I'm about to say, who, who, I was a doctor, a respected doctor in town, for goodness sake. Uh, and uh, the Examiner newspaper, and I went to speak to my family on the mainland who were great about it. But I thought I should go and speak to the neighbours. I lived out in the bush in a little house and I went and knocked on doors. And they, I used to meet them at the local Baptist church on Sunday morning where the men stood in one circle and the women stood in another. And I, uh, they opened the door and I'd say, hello, um, you know, uh, I've come across to tell you that I'm homosexual. <laughs> Um, this drew long periods of silence for the poor people confronted with this uh, young doctor from across the river. And the last folk, I said, uh, hello, Ted and Ivy, I'm, uh, I'm, home I'm just come across to tell you I'm homosexual. I, I remember her looking to him and saying, oh, we think we've got an uncle a bit like that too. <laughs> Anyway, the genie was out of the bottle and punishment came thick and fast. So did the letters from uh, women and men who uh, were also uh, lesbian and gay. The words weren't so commonly used those days as they are now. Uh, but uh, uh, 
the word, the tirades came thick and fast, quoting in particular that misanthrope of ancient times, St Paul, uh, but who said that not only should uh, women be seen and not heard, uh, but that men who lie with each other should be put to death. And uh, people who think uh, he was uh, in some way or other a, a prophet of the times, he added that you shouldn't drink red wine. So he had strictures all over the place. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, he's had enormous sway and done a terrific amount of harm to women and to children uh, and to LGBTI people over the last 2,000 years. But uh, the genie was out of the bottle and uh, the great thing for me as an environmentalist and a, green, and a green politician all the way down the line, as everybody knew about it, whenever I was doing anything that was successful or I ran into somebody and was seen on television talking to that person, they would get letters in the mail within a day or two uh, about my sexuality. People were obsessed by it. But the world has changed so wonderfully since then. I know the pro progress has a long way to go. But it has changed so wonderfully that here we are in 2015 with a recalcitrant government, but nevertheless the inevitability of equal marriage coming uh, to this country simply because the great majority of Australians, mostly heterosexual, doesn't matter what religion, doesn't matter what political party, the majority of Australians want to see discrimination in the Marriage Act removed. That's the Australia we have, and we have a government that does, and a Prime Minister who's opposed to that process, and it's simply a matter of time until uh, the whole country moves around them and moves into the future. I had um, um, right back in my early political career, nevertheless, isolation. And uh, Gillian Triggs was talking about Nick Turnan, uh, the young fellow who went to the United Nations and got the law of uh, um, preventing discrimination, the international law, effectively applied in Australia. And his partner back then was the fantastic advocate uh, who's helping lead the debate for marriage equality now, Rodney Croom. And they were, I don't know, 20 year olds or something like that. I was by now in the Tasmanian Parliament, um, having failed at the first election simply because of the homophobic um, campaign that was run. But I was nevertheless in there uh, and talking about the environment and these young fellows um, were part of a suddenly coming out of society, uh, young women and men, for equal rights, for gay and lesbian people as, as the... Um, terminology of, by then had it. And um, farmer Paul Thomas was helping to organise a forum on the issue. And I got asked to it to talk about campaigning. And I've never forgotten that 1988 forum because uh, I thought I'd spend the rest of my life uh, as a lone individual. But uh, at it, one of the things I took from my environmental campaigning to these young revolutionaries for GLBTI rights was get an opinion poll done. Put down a marker on what public opinion is. And if you don't have a good result, keep it, because the next one will be better. If you have a majority result, publish it. Well, I've forgotten what it was in 1988, but it was something like 33% wanted gay law, homosexual law reform in Tasmania. It wasn't, and it wasn't published, but it was only a matter of a couple of years before that changed. And the next opinion poll was 37%, and up it went. And so they were able to come out and say, public opinion is swinging in our direction. And the public loves nothing than to be with a power move, a shift in the right direction. And when they know that shift is occurring, they feel freer to join, leave some outdated social uh, environmental, economic, whatever, paradigm of the past and join with the new. And that's just what happened. Uh, but what I didn't know was that after I left the State Parliament in 
after 10 years, in 1993, I couldn't stand it one day longer. Uh, I went uh, and had three years off and I travelled a lot and I spoke to a lot of folk around the place and uh, working on the election campaign when I did agree to stand for the Senate in 1995 six again was uh, Paul Thomas and on the day of the election which is extraordinarily tense for any candidate um, I said to him, he was, he was the last one left, everybody was handing out how to vote cards and he was the last one left there. Handy, uh, he was sweeping the place up ready for the party that night. But the opinion polls, which indicated I might get in, were starting to turn down. And I said, oh, Paul, I'm going to go away and I always do this before elections and spend the afternoon sitting on a hillside somewhere and just uh, thinking about how to handle tonight, both a bad outcome and a good outcome. Well, he said, I'll come with you. Oh, I thought. Uh, what, on one thing, thinking that private personal contemplation would be a good thing. On the other hand, thinking what a lovely bloke this was. And uh, we went and sat on a rock and on some rocks by a stream and talked with each other. And... Uh, I not only got through that night much better, but uh, within a few months after being elected to the Senate, uh, we were off on a holiday together and amazing all our friends around and uh, things have never looked back. And there is a great truth in life that companionship is a unparalleled wonder. And I hope uh, for those of you who've got it, it's long and wonderful. And I say to all of those of you who haven't got it, it's there waiting in the wings. It didn't get to me until I was, of, of the, the richest variety, it didn't get to me until I was uh, well on in life, but is now part of the incredible happiness that I have. And just last Monday when it snowed in Tasmania, right across, right down to sea level, what a wonderful thing to go with Paul around the lambs in the snow. And I've got a great shot of this panorama of snow uh, right to the mountains in the background and there in the middle is a tiny little figure of Paul in his farmlands bringing down that morning's ewe with her lamb into the warmth of the shed. I'm a photographer too you see in my retirement times. Look, um, we, so here we are in 2015 and there's a lot of transformation in our society and global society yet to come. Uh, and the world is full of horrors. It's full of beauties, but it's still full of horrors. And how do we handle that? Uh, whether we're activists or whether we're simply trying to get our own lives together or whether we're trying to um, help other people to have more satisfactory lives themselves. There's a few little things I've learnt along the way. One of them is that intelligence is a burden. Uh, the great philosopher of last century, Bertrand Russell, Red Russell he was called because he was a socialist, he was in the aristocracy, but uh, they qu quickly the Murdoch media would have called him a co communist these days. However, he said, the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure. This is no comment on current politics, by the way. It was written 70 years ago. <laughs> the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of self-doubt. Ain't that so? However, here's the challenge to the intelligent. Get over it. Because it's very important. Uh, because uh, being full of self-doubt deprives one of, I think, one of the fundamentals of happiness in life, which is self-confidence. We tend to look at what we see as our own shortcomings and wait for somebody else to take the podium. I'm not going to talk about alpha males here, uh, but well, yes, I will. They need displacing. 
uh, we need generous, kind-hearted, caring people to be in charge of this planet. And that's not what we've got at the moment. And, and it's up to intelligent people full of self-doubt to do it. I did, by the way, in 1976, back there when I uh, announced my homosexuality, I was asked uh, just before that to go to a local debating society. I was in Launceston by now, the new doctor in town, terrific. So I went down, I rode my bicycle, jumped the fence. There were about 30 people in the, in the room and I said, well, I'm here to talk about uh, the mismanagement of the planet. And in short, gave a 20 minute peroration on the fact that we men had stuffed it up and it was time that women took over the planet. I was very uh, simplistic back then. And that uh, for the next century or two, uh, males should abrogate the political scene and simply allow women, wall-to-wall -wall women, to take over the world because I thought it couldn't be any worse and it might be a hell of a lot better. Question and answer time, there was none. I was, uh, there was stony silence. So I thought, oh, maybe I'm a bit ahead of my time here and I went and jumped the fence and rode away again. Uh, now, now, such simplicities are full of shortcomings and we all know that. However, uh, it does, I do love having been part of a political party, you know, the third political party in Australia, which not only has been advocating equal rights for GLBTI people, amazed me that at the last election 90% of people voted against that for parties which don't stand for that. However, that's the way uh, democracy does or doesn't work. And um, not only that, have uh, a majority of women in the parties. In fact, the new Tasmanian makeup is three women out of three. So my 1976 speech has sort of come true, at least in Tasmania, as far as the Greens are concerned. But, um, you know, the world is transforming. However, I see um, a lot of danger in where we're at. We not only have uh, great injustices in the way human society works, uh, but we do have 7.3 billion of us marauding the planet and using at the moment 140% of the living resources of the planet. That is uh, much more than it can sustain. And therefore, every morning we wake up, there is less farmland to feed more people. There is that 500 times rate of extinction of our fellow creatures which have a right on this planet uh, than there was before the Industrial Revolution. The fisheries of the world, 90% are in decline or have collapsed. Forests are going backward at a, an enormous rate. And we are on a planet in which uh, we have a God-given intelligence, if you like, or an evolved intelligence, uh, but we're not using it because we are subject to a new Global religion, which is materialism, more for me now, uh, and which has at the centre of it the God, capital G, growth. Uh, and you'll hear this every night on television, on the ABC, in the Murdoch media, and on any politician who wants to stay in their job. You must foster growth. On a planet that's already seeing an overshoot of the ability to re replenish its living resources for this one herd of 7.3, biggest mass of mammals ever on the face of the planet, headed for 11 to 12 billion, according to the United Nations, before it tapers off at the end of the century. That's why I'm an environmental campaigner, because I love this planet, I love the people who are on it, and I like the diversity, the biodiversity of the planet, which so far as we know, is the only one in the universe, and there's trillions of them, and there's billions like this, but so far as we know to date is the only one which has not only life and awareness and conscience, but the ability through that consciousness of, of us in humanity to change the biology of the planet, the biosphere, this cradling, nurturing planet, $93 billion miles from the nearest nuclear reactor we need to be close to, which is our star, the sun, perfectly placed 
and cradled us into existence over a long period of time and here we are changing that humidity grid and thinking it doesn't matter because materialism has taken up short-sighted uh, growth and greed and greed is good and uh, we have a the only way we can solve that, ladies and gentlemen, is by using this intelligence and being confident about it and by using it through the democratic process. And there will be an election coming up next year on not only those matters I've just spoken about, but on whether or not the majority of this country had a right to see in this term of government equal marriage. And the vote in the box that we place will either be for that right having been trampled on or against it. No, there's other issues. I know it's complicated, but changing of votes is what democracy is about if we're going to advance more rapidly. And as the richest country and the richest people in terms of dollars ever to exist on the face of the planet, and therefore with the greatest responsibility to bring change to this planet so that we can all live together and with our planet in a sustainable relationship so that our grandchildren and their grandchildren, as well as our fellow creatures, have a future on it, going right off into the future rather than collapse writ large because this materialism and growth wasn't tackled. And at the basis of that inequality, and we must vote against those who would who would um, keep inequality going. Uh, that includes inequality between the haves and the have-nots, not only within our country, but globally, because we're all sisters and brothers. We are all in this together in 2015. We haven't been before, we are now. And the destiny of each individual in humanity, at least of their progeny coming down the line, is shared by every other individual. So there, there's the challenge for us. What a wonderful world it is. What a great privilege it is that we can change it. And change must begin, of course, at home. And what a great opportunity at the ballot box coming just down the line to us to make sure that we put into the past discrimination, at least in the terms of marriage in this country and have equal marriage and move on to tackle all the other things that need tackling to make this world happier, more optimistic and fulfilling for everyone, including the least. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>